Tonight, our speaker is Peter Preble. Peter is a member of the Board of Directors of the Saskatchewan Environmental Society. He is the author or co-author of publications on climate change, the Fukushima nuclear power plant accident, Saskatchewan's renewable energy potential, and stricter regulation of the oil sands industry. Peter served as policy director of the Saskatchewan Environmental Society for many years. He also served as an MLA in the Saskatchewan legislature for 16 years. He has been involved in provincial initiatives related to wind power, energy conservation, and protected areas. He is a founding member of the SES Solar Cooperative and has and was its president for three years. Peter has a business administration degree from the University of Prince Edward Island, and he has master's degrees from the University of Saskatchewan in education and in sustainable environmental management. The title of Peter's presentation is The Climate Emergency, Putting Saskatchewan on a Path to Sustainability. so much for coming out on a blustery evening. It's wonderful to have the rain, of course, but uh, it's not always so pleasant to driving and walking in, so I really appreciate you being here. I, um, <coughs> I'm gonna talk a little bit at first about uh, climate science, and the latest climate science is what I wanna share with you. Uh, you'll see here on the screen, uh, um, a, a graph that's just been published by uh, the, the World Meteorological Organization. And um, it's showing um, the increase in global average temperature um, since the um, industrial age began. And as you know, uh, many of you will know that the Paris Agreement um, calls uh, on the world to hold global average temperature to, if possible, an increase of no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius. And there's a commitment, an ironclad commitment among all countries to try to hold global average temperature for sure to no more than a two degree Celsius increase. And, um, and what we see in this graph is that uh, global average temperature in 2023 compared to the, the pre-industrial age has risen 1.45 degrees Celsius. Um, so, uh, to be clear, what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says is there has to be a decade of global average temperature increase of 1.5 before you've actually, um, cons it's considered to be that much of an increase. But this is a real warning sign about where we're heading, uh, to have a sharp temperature increase that is um, uh, much more than uh, than scientists predicted. You know, scientists are quite alarmed at what's gone on this year. And uh, there's a, a real shift in, in opinion, and there's also a, a, div a division in opinion about whether climate change is accelerating or whether this is just what we should have expected. Uh, and of course, El Nino has made a difference in terms of driving temperature up, as it always does. But what you see on a graph over many years is that the La Nina events are getting hotter and hotter, Neutral is getting hotter and hotter, and the, um, uh, the El Nino events are getting hotter and hotter. And now, of course, we've just had an, an El Nino year predominantly. And this next, uh, this next graph shows you, uh, this is the, the 1.5 Celsius temperature increase, and this shows you the number of days in the year that went over 1.5. So you can, you can see on this uh, particular uh, graph that there were all kinds of days that were 1.7, 1.8, 1 1.9 degrees um, uh, above what you would normally expect at this particular time of year. So it's a, another warning sign for us. And of course this is predominantly being driven by an increase in uh, in three greenhouse gases, and many of you will be familiar with these, but uh, carbon dioxide is the biggest 
influence. Uh, and you can see here how it's increased um, from, uh, it's over on the left-hand side, and you can see it's, it's increased uh, since 1960 from uh, just under 340 parts per million now to almost 420 parts per million. Officially, um, the, uh, uh, the World Meteorological Organization declared it at 419.3 parts per million uh, during, on average, in 2023. And it's now, in 2024, it's jumped up well above that. So it's increasing at about two and a half parts per million per year. And what we need to do as a global community is bring that increase down to zero. And the important thing about carbon dioxide, and some of you will be familiar with this, but its average lifetime in the atmosphere is 100 years. Some of it, about 15 to 20 percent of it, will remain into the atmosphere a thousand years after it's being released from our coal-fired power plants, uh, from our um, cars and factories. Uh, and some of it, of course, will be taken up uh, much, much more quickly within a period of 25 or 30 years by the oceans, by vegetation. But about half of it is not taken up uh, in that way, and it lingers in the atmosphere for very, very long periods of time. And of course, that's what's driving uh, um, uh, climate change. Uh, similarly, uh, you see a, uh, an increase in nitrous oxide. This is in parts per, bi per billion rather than parts per million. But uh, again, the rise is steady every year. It keeps increasing. Uh, partly as a result of, uh, of our use of nitrogen fertilizers, partly from things like coal-fired power plants also emitting nitrous oxide. Um, here's the increase for methane, and I'll spend some time talking about methane tonight because um, methane was leveling out for a little while, as you can see on the graph, and now it's, it's jumped again uh, significantly. Um, and, um, and methane is, the, is a gas that, like unlike carbon dioxide with such a long average lifetime in the atmosphere, and nitrous oxide with a fixed time in the atmosphere of about 112 to 114 years. Methane is only in the atmosphere for 10, 12, 13 years. And, uh, and because it's got a shorter atmospheric lifetime, if we can drive it down in a significant way, we can put a dent in the, in the climate emergency. <coughs> Here's uh, just a quote from the, uh, the new Secretary General to the, I'm sorry, this, for some reason this, uh, uh, this isn't looking like it did at home, but, so forgive me, but, uh, uh, but this is the new Secretary General of the um, World Meteorological Organization, and she says, never have we been so close, albeit on a temporary basis at the moment, to the 1.5 degrees Celsius lower limit of the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. I just want to say a word about uh, the last three months because what is uh, telling is that even though the El Nino event is coming to an end, uh, the rise in global average temperature has continued in, into January, February, March. Uh, and, uh, and these are the three warmest January, February, and March months on record in the 175 years that, uh, that records have been kept. So we're seeing uh, and we're seeing the oceans continue now for 12 consecutive months. Uh, every January has been the, the hottest in the ocean, every February, every March, uh, every December in the last year. So um, it's, uh, it, it's an, another important warning sign for us. And of course the ocean is taking up the vast, vast majority of heat that's being generated by greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, over 90%. Actually, scientists are estimating it. 95% of the heat uh, that's being generated by greenhouse gases is remaining in the ocean. So, of course, it will be also released by the ocean at times. And I, I included this chart because I wanted you to see where the parts of the world that were record hot um, uh, this year. And so all the dark red is the parts of the world that were record hot. including the Northwest Territories, and you saw this kind of a temperature way up north uh, at Fort Good Hope um, on, on, uh, on July uh, 8th of 2023. 
Um, these are kind of unprecedented temperatures that the Northwest Territories in Northern Canada were experiencing. And um, I think one of the, you know, one of the biggest impacts, of course, from uh, climate change is the increase in extreme weather events. And what you may not know is that they've increased five-fold over the last 50 years. So this is a, a really clear signal to the world that, um, that, that the climate is breaking down. And, um, and of course, there are so many uh, consequences for human civilization as a result of, of this increase in severe weather events. Um, uh, one of them, of course, is that um, uh, one of the forms of extreme weather that doesn't get nearly enough attention, uh, and particularly in our part of the world where we don't experience a lot of extreme heat, um, is, uh, is the loss of life from extreme heat. And it's not well recorded around the world. Uh, the World Health Organization estimates that uh, the, the, although we have official numbers at uh, almost um, 500,000 people in the course of the year, that the real toll is about 30 times that. Uh, you know, so many countries don't track uh, death from uh, uh, extreme heat. Um, uh, and, um, uh, but we, we do a better job of that in the industrialized world. They do a good job of that in Europe. For instance, in 2022, um, the 35 European countries experienced 60,000 people died from extreme heat in Europe. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, in, in places that the heat is much more extreme, um, good statistics are not kept. And here you see um, one of the, the, sh the important changes that is happening. Uh, heat waves are lasting longer on average about four days longer. Uh, I'm talking globally now, not, not in, in Canada. And, uh, and they're traveling more slowly. And, uh, and, and so um, they're, 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 people are experiencing them for longer periods of time. And that's having a real impact in, uh, in, in many parts of the world where heat is becoming a huge problem. Heat waves are traveling uh, about eight kilometers per day more slowly. Um, uh, in each decade uh, for the past 40 years. And, uh, and in Phoenix, Arizona in 2023, they had 31 consecutive days where the temperature was over 110 degrees uh, Fahrenheit and they peaked at uh, what for us would be in Celsius a, a little over 44 degrees Celsius. So th these are hot days and for anybody who doesn't have air conditioning, for anybody who's homeless, uh, these are very, very dangerous uh, days to experience. Uh, of course, what we're experiencing in Saskatchewan, one of our impacts is, is drought. Uh, the, the U.S. Midwest has been experiencing drought for the last couple of decades. We're starting, as, as, as the influence moves further north, we're starting to experience this more too. Uh, you can see that over the last three years, the Crop Insurance Corporation has paid out $6 billion to uh, agriculture producers as a result of, uh, of crop damage. And a lot of this, of course, is, uh, is the vast majority is associated with the droughts that we've been experiencing. And here's the, uh, the most recent Canadian drought monitor. Uh, we're all familiar with the fact that we've been facing drought here uh, and west of Saskatoon it quickly gets a lot more serious. Uh, we're lucky to be getting uh, rain uh, tonight. And the reality is that you can see from this map that BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, um, we're all in drought, so the drought is extensive. And one of the hallmarks of um, climate change when it comes to the drought is if the drought is being experienced over a very wide geographical area. And, uh, and that's certainly the case with vast parts of the United States and, uh, and Canada in uh, experiencing drought now for, for several years of uh, quite an extreme nature. Uh, we all know about the forest fires that, um, that we've been experiencing in Saskatchewan recently. Um, it, we lost 1.9 million hectares to, uh, to forest fires uh, last year in this province. Nationwide, um, the figure was uh, 18 and a half 
um, million hectares. And there's the change nationally that you can see. Uh, it's, it's an enormous change in 2023, uh, with Canada experiencing a, a forest fire season like no other, with uh, about 230,000 Canadians having to be evacuated, uh, with some Aboriginal communities um, experiencing evacuation twice in the course of a, of a summer. It was a, a very, very difficult summer and with an enormous loss of biomass. And here you see the, the carbon emissions associated with the wildfires in Canada um, in 2023 compared with all the previous years. So there was so much carbon dioxide going up into the atmosphere in 2023 that it starts to approach Canada's national emissions. That's how alarming it is. And, um, uh, and again, uh, being driven by higher greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere. We lost an area five times the size of Prince Albert National Park. Uh, and, and the fires weren't just limited to, um, uh, to uh, you know, the Norman, Northern Hemisphere. Uh, the Southern Hemisphere now over the winter has been experiencing very difficult forest fire seasons as well. This is Chile. This picture um, uh, just captures the fact that 13, 1,300 people lost their homes. 1,300 homes were lost, so 1,300 families lost their homes uh, as a result of forest fires in Chile uh, in, uh, in February of 2024. UNICEF, one of the big impacts, of course, of extreme weather is, is human displacement. And uh, it's probably, in my mind, it's the worst impact. And UNICEF has done, has just prepared a report on the number of children who have been displaced over the last six years. And, um, and as you can see there, they're, they're putting that at, um, at 43 million children, which works out to about 20,000 children a day worldwide. So this is an enormous impact from climate change. And you know, when you think about the fact that we're about 1 700th of global emissions in this province, we should think about the fact that we're also responsible for 1 700th of this child displacement. And, um, uh, and that ends up being a pretty substantial figure. So it's just, uh, this is a controversial statement that I'm making that not everybody will agree with, that we should somehow take responsibility for events in other parts of the world. But the big impact of our greenhouse gas emissions is not on Saskatchewan residents. The big impact of our greenhouse gas emissions is on the global community. And so every country that's responsible for large amounts of emissions, in my mind, <coughs> should take some responsibility for the impact those emissions are having worldwide. And of course, another impact right across the world is an increase in uh, damage to property from extreme weather. Uh, the majority of damage is, is not insured, but of course a portion of it is. And here you see the insured portion in Canada. Um, and uh, this figure here, just to put it in context, for 2022 is $3.1 billion. And uh, you can see the worst year was, was 2016 with the Fort McMurray fire, but um, uh, there's been a very sharp increase over the last few decades in, in insurance loss. And this is adjusted for inflation, so. Another impact that we're experiencing uh, that I worry about is the impact on our glaciers. And, uh, and the World Meteorological Organization just issued a report on glaciers saying that uh, it, we had an enormous loss of glacier melt in, uh, in the, the North American Rockies, both in the United States and in, and in Canada. Um, and, uh, the, the actual loss over the last three years in terms of ice volume was 9%, which is a stunning loss to our glaciers in a three year period. Now that's an average for North America. They didn't issue a Canadian number, which I was looking for, but unfortunately I couldn't find it in the data. So that includes the United States as well as, as, well as Canada. And this is a picture of the Pato Glacier. Um, and um, and the, it's just a small glacier, but it's one of the reference glaciers in the Canadian Rockies that is monitored every year and it, and it goes into the global records. And, uh, and you can see that there's been a very significant loss on that 
uh, on that glacier uh, in recent years. It, it feeds the, uh, uh, the, uh, the North Saskatchewan River, and over the last 50 years, it's lost about 70% of its volume in terms of ice. Of course, the ice loss isn't limited to the glaciers. It's also being experienced in Antarctica. It's being experienced in the Arctic. Uh, it's being experienced on Greenland. And, uh, and here you sort of see, a, you know, the change that's happening on Greenland with, you know, parts of Greenland losing their ice and kind of turning into, and, and starting to actually in some spots even grow shrubs. Uh, but about 200 billion tons of ice a year is being lost on Greenland. And to put that in perspective again in terms of Saskatchewan's greenhouse gas emission contribution to that ice loss, it's over 300 million tons a year uh, just on Greenland alone. And uh, I was mentioning that sea surface um, temperatures are record high. Here you sort of see how that red line over in the left-hand corner is uh, January, February, March of uh, 2023. So those months are, uh, are record high. And of course, one of the consequences of all that is that uh, is sea level rise, and sea level rise is accelerating. And here are the exact numbers. Um, you see, uh, from 1993 to 2002, sea level rose uh, 2.14 millimeters a year, whereas by uh, 2013 to 2022, it rose at 4.72 millimeters a year. So you can see that sea level rise is accelerating uh, in every decade. And, um, uh, and again, it's happening, I think, a little more rapidly than scientists uh, predicted. <coughs> One of the big impacts of a warmer ocean is the impact on coral reefs. And, um, and coral reefs are very vulnerable to uh, ocean temperature rise. Um, the, um, the international scientific community predicts that coral reefs will virtually be wiped out globally if global average temperature hits two degrees Celsius. But right now, um, uh, over the last few months, there's been massive coral reef bleaching all over the world. The Great Barrier Reef gets uh, some news media attention, but this is happening globally. Uh, there's there's uh, uh, there's hundreds of thousands of reefs that are that are dying as a result of the uh, the ocean temperatures that we've just been experiencing in the last two or three months. Here you see just a slide that shows coral bleaching. Uh, which happens, uh, sometimes the reefs recover after they bleach, but uh, often uh, if the bleaching is extensive for two or three weeks, uh, a lot of them die. And here's just the, uh, the IPCC uh, um, uh, picture that shows an expected 99% of coral reefs will be lost at, at a, a temperature increase of two degrees Celsius globally. Um, and this, uh, this slide just makes the point that that climate change impacts are, are not being experienced equally in the world. Um, we're, we're living in a part of the world where uh, we're experiencing a lot less impacts than, than many other parts of the world. And it's not that we're not experiencing impacts, obviously we are, but, um, but Africa is experiencing the worst impacts of all. And, uh, and it's expected that in terms of loss of life, uh, about 50% of it will take place in, in Africa in, in the coming decades uh, as a result of, of elevated greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere. So the, the dark red area is the, uh, are the areas that are going to be impacted the worst. And um, of course, the, the, what's required to prevent catastrophic climate change is to keep global average temperature ideally below uh, a 1.5 degree Celsius temperature increase, and most certainly to keep it below a two degree Celsius temperature increase. But at this point, every one-tenth of an increase in global average temperature matters a lot in terms of what happens uh, from now on. And what this chart makes the point of is that if you want to keep global average temperature to 1.5, you've got to bring emissions dramatically down from where they are right now, and very, very rapidly. If you want to 
hold it to 1.7, you need to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. You can wait a little bit longer if you want to hold it to two degrees Celsius, but, um, but not that long. And every one of these um, lines downwards means deep cuts in greenhouse gas emissions rapidly. And this is something that uh, our, our government in Saskatchewan is definitely not contemplating or considering. And the, the only point I wanted to make here is that, and this applies to everyone in the world because every country needs to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, every single country. But uh, we really are the last generation uh, alive now uh, that actually can make a difference in terms of preventing catastrophic climate change. We are the last generation because the next generation, if we don't bring emissions down in the way that um, uh, the previous slide suggested, uh, the, you know, the, the, the next generation will just be experiencing these events. And it won't mean that it doesn't make a big difference to still bring emissions down to zero. It just means that there'll be a lot of loss of life and loss of property and and human suffering and suffering in the animal community and the, and the plant community on Earth if we don't uh, if we don't act. And this final slide about the climate change update is just comparing um, the European experience with our experience here in Saskatchewan. You know, to the credit of the European Union, and there's Greta Thunberg and and tens of thousands of others have done a wonderful job of underlining the inadequacy of European climate policy. But nevertheless, the Europeans have achieved collectively a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions of about 30% below what they were in 1990. And they're, and they're targeting a 55% reduction by 2030. And you just compare that with the Saskatchewan numbers, which are not just the responsibility of the cur current government, but also responsibility of the government that I was part of. So these are, but, um, uh, but in 1990, uh, greenhouse gas emissions in Saskatchewan were 42,500,000 tons. And today they're 67,100,000 tons. So we're way above 1990 levels while the Europeans are substantially below. So you can see this huge difference in policy implementation on the two continents. It's an enormous difference in terms of how seriously climate change is being taken. Um, so here are some of my suggestions about what we could do. Um, first of all, uh, in Saskatchewan specifically, and uh, I wanna emphasize that not all of these are Saskatchewan Environmental Society policy, in fact, quite a few of them are, uh, but I think it's important to talk about them. Um, and, uh, and one of the things you have to do in government is, is actually you know, create some institutional change. You have to hire new people who are gonna care about climate change in all the relevant departments. It takes a few months to get that done. And you have to kind of set up structures that are going to help move you forward. Um, and um, I'm suggesting we create a climate council like the, like the United Kingdom has. Uh, and, um, and that in specifically in Saskatchewan to uh, advise government on climate policy, but all that advice would be public. It's not private advice like a public servant would give. And, uh, and to hold uh, the provincial government accountable to the implementation of a climate change plan. And that there would be a just transition committee within that climate council that would pay attention to, you know, making sure, for instance, that when it, employees are being negatively impacted by climate policy, that, that, they're, um, that they're looked after. Uh, and that's going to be associated with something like the phasing out of coal-fired power stations in the province. Um, uh, just one, one of many examples. And that we would, um, and that we would reestablish Saskatchewan's Office of Energy Conservation, uh, which Premier Calvert and I were involved in setting up in 2002, and by the way, which was immediately abolished by the current government within a month of coming to office with all the staff we got. Uh, I think uh, virtually all of us in this room would like to see the carbon tax um, remain in place as a public policy. Uh, the, uh, the new um, rebates just took effect in the last few days. People will be getting their checks. A family 
Afora will get a, a rebate check for three hundred and ninety-six dollars. Um, and um, uh, but it's a it's a policy that requires political courage to implement. I have to say that the current federal government deserves, in my mind, in my books, credit for doing that. And uh, pretty well every other political party in the House of Commons is, with the exception of the Greens, is abandoning them at this point in terms of uh, support for uh, uh, the carbon tax. Um, and then, you know, reversing policies that are, um, uh, that are just, you know, there were there have been a whole bunch of policy changes in the last 20 years that just don't make any sense at all and are completely in, incompatible with the Paris Agreement. And, um, mm -hmm. and reversing those becomes really, really important to do. Um, uh, in the government that I was part of, for instance, we increased the speed limit on divided highways to 110 kilometers an hour. And as you know, everybody now drives 115 to 120. Uh, you know, that's a, that was just an unwise policy decision. It was unfortunately though, it was an incredibly popular policy decision. And when I came home and talked about it with my constituency association, Everyone in the room said it was the right thing to do. Tell me, <laughs> these were all my friends. <laughs> so uh, um, we need to we need to sort of cancel the uh, the current Saskatchewan government's plan to expand the oil industry by twenty five percent of this province. Uh, that just doesn't make any sense. And the international, the United Nations is pleading with countries to halt the expansion of oil and gas, uh, uh, to stop more drilling. Um, very few countries are listening; a handful are. Uh, but um, you know, to expand the industry is just insanity in the face of the climate crisis. Similarly, the plan to uh, double the forest harvest in this province over the next few years by 2030, you know, doesn't make any sense in the in the face of recommendations from the international scientific community to immediately stop all deforestation. Um, so uh, those are just examples of what needs to be changed. Um, repealing the Saskatchewan First Act, which is a piece of legislation that passed in the last year and its, its primary purpose is to serve as an obstacle to um, federal climate policy being implemented in the province of Saskatchewan. That's the reason it was passed and, uh, and the provincial government is using it exactly that way to try to um, uh, argue against uh, a federal cap on uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the oil sector, uh, to argue against um, the phase out of coal-fired power plants uh, in the province of Saskatchewan by 2030, which is a federal regulation. Um, so um, those, are, um, those are all things that I think kind of need to be done right away. Um, and. You know, it would be nice to try to, uh, and these are all initiatives that you're quite familiar with, so I'm just gonna touch on them for a moment. But, you know, changing our building code so that we rapidly move to a net zero ready house construction and commercial building construction just would make a lot of sense. Uh, having provincial grants for uh, new uh, energy efficient house construction, super energy efficient house construction, and, uh, and uh, for um, home retrofit so that we complement the, the federal incentives that are already in place. Uh, making sure that, um, uh, that we incentivize uh, the, um, uh, the purchase of uh, uh, plug-in hybrids, um, electric vehicles. Um, uh, you know, this, this is really important uh, to do as well. And, uh, and to have um, a more ambitious target for greenhouse gas emission reduction in the industrial sector. The province's target is a 12% reduction in emissions uh, by 2030. Uh, what we need is a 40% reduction in emissions in the industrial sector by 2040. So that requires really substantial policy change and a rethinking of what's being done with the, with the industrial price of carbon. Um, I want to talk now about uh, two areas in a, in a bit more detail. Uh, one is with respect to methane. And, um, and I just want to uh, emphasize that methane emissions in this province are way higher than what is being officially reported. 
by the government of Saskatchewan and even by the government of Canada. And why this isn't being corrected is very troubling. Uh, but um, back in 2020, um, uh, a PhD scientist with a huge amount of experience in Environment Canada, Doug Worthy, uh, with a whole bunch of his other colleagues at Environment Canada, the led a study uh, for eight years. It had gone on for eight years, from 2012 to 2020, into uh, methane emissions in the oil and gas sector in Alberta and Saskatchewan. And because of all the issues along the border, it's so hard to sort out, you know, emissions at the border and which where there's which province they're associated with. And so they they did it for both provinces together, and they found that methane emissions were. Uh, 1.9 times higher than being reported by, by government and by industry. Uh, and, uh, and given the fact that the official numbers for methane emissions in Saskatchewan were already um, over 17 million tons a year, uh, carbon dioxide equivalent, and to put that in context, total provincial emissions are, are 67 million tons. So, you know, um, th this is a big deal. Uh, if, if that means that the 17 million might have been close to 32 or 33 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, uh, according to Worthy's work. And, uh, and a couple of other studies have been done since then that point in exactly the same direction. Uh, and the most recent one is, uh, was done by Matthew Johnson um, at the, um, uh, who's based in, uh, uh, at, at Carleton University, and he led a team of researchers there. And um, I want to apologize that some of these, these slides don't look at all like they did on my computer, and I'm so sorry. <laughs> but, uh, but they, anyway, Matthew Johnson led a, uh, a team that looked at, um, uh, at 962 oil sands facilities in Saskatchewan. So in other words, this is heavy oil, and particularly heavy oil along the, the border and found that the emissions from methane were 3.9 times higher than the industry was reporting. Now, the Saskatchewan government hasn't responded to any of these um, studies uh, in, in, an, in expressing any concern about them at all. Uh, its messaging has been very different. Its messaging has been, uh, we created Saskatchewan regulations uh, to reduce methane emissions, and we've cut them by 70% and we're to be commended for doing that. We've got one of the lowest rates of methane emissions in the world. That's the, that's the message from the provincial government. But um, what they don't mention is that the federal government required them to introduce those regulations because it had federal regulations in place that were going to be implemented if the province didn't uh, implement them. But now the feds are saying uh, uh, methane emissions have to come down 75% from where they were in 2012. And the provincial government is saying, we're going to have nothing to do with this. And we're going to use the Saskatchewan First Act to block you in, in, uh, in, in, in putting that policy into place. But meanwhile, the, the problem is that the baseline that everybody is operating from is 17 million tons, which according to the government, they've now shaved more than 11 million tons off that. So we're down at five or six million tons according to them. But if Johnson's work and Doug Worthy's work is correct, uh, and, uh, and the original figure was 17 million tons instead. Uh, the official figure was 17 million tons, but the real figure was over 30 million tons. Then, of course, you've still got uh, 17 or 18 or 19 million tons of methane emissions uh, kicking around and, and being released into the atmosphere each year by the Saskatchewan oil industry. And, um, and this is a big, big, big problem. So, um, and methane is a very potent greenhouse gas. Um, it's at least 25 times more potent over a 100-year period than uh, carbon dioxide. But uh, over a 20-year period, of course, those numbers skyrocket substantially because the, the lifetime of methane is so short, right? So, uh, you know, 10, 10 to 14 years in the atmosphere. One of the, the exciting things that's happened is that our ability to measure methane is improving by leaps and bounds. Uh, these recent, this recent work that people like Matthew Johnson did, you know, involved aerial surveys uh, as well as work on the ground in terms of analysis. And, um, and now we've got the capacity to measure me uh, methane emissions into the atmosphere via satellites. 
and the Environmental Defense Fund has just been working on uh, with the uh, New Zealand Space Agency on a, uh, a new um, way of measuring methane by satellite that is going to give us global a global picture of methane emissions and a detailed picture uh, at the local level as well. So, and this data is going to become public. So we'll have the ability to actually look at what's happening in Saskatchewan. Uh, and it'll be really exciting, and it'll be a way of applying significant pressure on the provincial government. Um, and this is kind of what these pictures look like. If a, a facility is releasing methane, you kind of see these. This is what the, the satellite will pick up. So, in terms of where we should, what we should target, um, I'm suggesting that the um, that we should target by 2030 to bring methane emissions in this province down to just over 4 million tons per year. Uh, and my guess is that they're around the 17, 18, 19, 20 million ton mark right now. So uh, this requires a much tighter, there were some regulations that were implemented that brought, I, b I believe the province when they say they, you know, they cut methane emissions by 11 million tons, and that's uh, to their credit. Uh, but we need to go way, way further than that. And, uh, and we need to do that, of course, not just in Saskatchewan, but right across Canada, right across North America. And it isn't just in Canada that methane emissions are being underestimated. The studies that are being done in the United States are pointing to a similar picture. You know, the industry hasn't, either hasn't been honest about uh, what they knew about methane emissions or, or, hasn't, or simply didn't have the equipment to properly uh, uh, measure them. And, and now, and this is the last kind of major piece of my presentation, and, and actually the piece that I've struggled with the most, but I want to talk about the electricity sector. And the reason I've struggled with this is that for years the Saskatchewan Environmental Society has said, you know, uh, very accurately, and I've been part of saying this, that, and, and so has Bob Halliday, and, and so has all our uh, board members, Ben Wright, uh, and Coxworth, we, you know, we've all been saying, we can import significant amounts of hydro from Manitoba, uh, 1,000 megawatts, hopefully. We can use those hydro imports to phase out our coal-fired power plants. Uh, but in the last you know, three years, the situation has slowly been changing in Manitoba. Uh, and and it, it's not that we're not importing some hydro, we are. We're actually going to end up importing about 290 megawatts of hydro. But, um, uh, but What's changing in Manitoba is that, you know, first of all, they've entered into all these export contracts with Minnesota, with Wisconsin. Now they're building new transmission capacity that's just been completed uh, with Minnesota for another, you know, 500 megawatts. Um, there, but the other thing that's happening is that they're experiencing drought. Their hydro supplies are becoming uh, less reliable. Manitoba Hydro's actually ended up losing money in, in a couple of years recently. And, um, and the other thing that's happening is that, of course, Manitoba, and especially under the new NDP government now, is thinking about electrifying more things, uh, and uh, including electric vehicles, of course. And, uh, and the government has announced that they're going to try to aim for a, a net zero emissions province-wide by 2050. Uh, they haven't put the policies in place to kind of move in that direction very rapidly right now, but they've only been in office for a few months. So, um, but they're, they're basically saying we think we're going to need more electricity for our own purposes. So I think we will, you know, um, Bob and I are actually going to make a trip to Manitoba next month and, uh, and we're going to try to get a better handle on, you know, what the ability is to work together. But one of the obvious ways in which we can work together is to build a lot more transmission capacity between our two provinces. It might not just be used for hydro, it might be used, for instance, to export wind, sell wind power back and forwards to one another, or to sell solar power back and forwards to one another. So having a thousand megawatts of the new transmission capacity between the two provinces would make a huge amount of sense. And, uh, and right now I think we have a federal government that would be willing to maybe put some money into that as well. They certainly have the programs in place to potentially do that if they chose to. This graph shows um, where we're at in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, that the solid part of it shows what's happened in the last 20 years. And you can see that the reality is we've made very little 
progress at SAS Power in terms of emission reduction, despite all the promises and pledges about how we were going to move, uh, you know, we're, we're maybe down four or five percent uh, compared to where we were in 2005. So, uh, so uh, sorry, compared to where we yeah we were in 2005. So the the um, there's a lot of work to do, and um, uh, and what you see with the dotted line is what SAS Power is hoping their projections will now be, but of course. Um, it's uncertain about whether those projected actions are actually going to be put in place or not. And um, I just want to give you a sense for the overall mix. You've, many of you will have seen this chart before. Bob had it in one of his very good presentations. But um, uh, the coal capacity is about a quarter of the generating capacity. Uh, and natural gas is now up at 40%. So as Bob often says, um, you know, SAS power is becoming a natural gas. Uh, utility. Uh, solar's at 2 now and wind is at 11 in terms of generating capacity. But I wanted to include this second graph because I think from a greenhouse gas emission point of view it's the most important. Because although coal is only at 24 percent generating capacity, it's supplying about 32 percent of our um, electricity needs. And gas is supplying right about where it's generating capacity. It's 40 percent. And wind as you would expect is supplying a little less than its generating capacity. But it's still pretty good, you know, generating capacity at 11%, it's meeting 8% of our electricity needs. Scaling up wind power in this province makes lots of sense. And uh, not surprisingly, solar is at one. And last year, disappointingly, hydro was at 12%, whereas the generating capacity is 19. So this reflects the drought uh, that we've been experiencing. And also the fact that we can't count on our hydro resource as much as we have in the past in terms of its reliability. In a, in a wet year, it'll be great. And in a drier year, um, it'll probably produce um, you know, less, less power. And there could be a fluctuation of as much as 30%. Um, uh, and here's the big change that's happened in the last year. The announcement by Premier Scott Moe that he's not going to pay any attention to the federal government's regulations to phase out coal-fired power plants. He's going to run the power plants as long as he likes, and for their lifetime, potentially. And, uh, and to heck with the federal government, and if, if they don't like it, come and arrest him, sort of thing, is what he's basically, you know, he's very clearly said that. So, um, so there's a, essentially a policy in place now that I think SAS Power is struggling with, because their stakeholder uh, public consultation still don't acknowledge the reality that the policy of the cabinet is to not phase coal-fired fired power out in this province. And, uh, uh, I, um, uh, and obviously it's really urgent to do that. And you know, even, I'm speaking for myself now, if I was in government, I could not achieve the phase out of coal by 2030 anymore because they've waited so long and done nothing for years and years and years and it, you know, it takes about a decade to do this properly. And they, they got lots of notice. It's not like they didn't know back in 2017, 2018 that this needed to be done. Uh, but, um, but you know, no action has been taken and you can't build new transmission capacity overnight. You know, you're looking at eight years to get it in place. You're, uh, you're, you know, to, to, uh, to scale up the sort of renewables that you would need and uh, an alternative baseline power. Um, you know, all, it all takes time. So I, I've sort of moved the date to 2032, and even that is optimistic in terms of phasing out coal, but it desperately needs to be done uh, in a couple of terms of the government. Um, here's a couple of statements from the North American Renewable Integration Study that I think are important. It was done a couple of years ago, and it said um, resource adequacy can be maintained with high contributions of variable generation. In other words, lots of wind and solar and you can still maintain uh, a, you know, a reliable grid. And they really encouraged interties and increased transmission uh, to be delivered and say it, said it would have system-wide benefits across North America and, you know, and long-term economic benefits. So in other words, there's lots of potential for introducing renewable energy onto the grid. And uh, you know, this is a very conservative study in terms of the care that went into it. Um, uh, utilities all across North America were involved in the work. Um, and so um, th these, I, I'm suggesting, uh, well, first of all, I'm suggesting, is, and you won't be surprised about this, and, and it's 
you know, there's some controversy associated with it. And again, this slide, I'm sorry, doesn't look at all like it did on my computer. But, um, but we should cancel plans for a small modular nuclear reactor in the province of Saskatchewan. Uh, and we should do that for both environmental and economic reasons. Um, uh, the, the, the economics are terrible. A $5 billion expenditure for a small modular nuclear reactor. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, all the additional costs that will be associated with managing the waste material um, for a very long time into the future. So um, it just doesn't make a lot of economic sense, and, it, and it's not particularly good environmental policy either. Uh, but, you know, we, we do need to acknowledge that nuclear power is, is carbon-free, and if the waste disposal issues could be addressed and the cost could come down, um, there may be parts of the world that, you know, where this is a viable choice. So I'm not dismissing it completely, but I, I just don't see it as something that we want in this province or in Bye, guys. Western North America. Um, and then uh, what I'm suggesting is that instead we invest that $5 billion in, in, uh, in wind power, in solar power, uh, in, in energy storage, in increased grid transmission connections between Manitoba and Saskatchewan. Um, and, uh, and, it, and very importantly, in energy efficiency initiatives. And that we work with Manitoba Hydro to, uh, to, to essentially see if we can import as much hydro as we can from Manitoba. And of course, we'll have to assess how much uh, hydro we can import, yeah, because I, I worry that it will be less than what we originally have suggested would be desirable. Um, and of course, that makes phasing up coal more challenging, because if we can't use hydro to replace it, it becomes more of a challenge. Um, and uh, I'm suggesting that we, you know, and Bob has suggested this too, and we've worked together in discussing it, of course, uh, but um, you know, I'm suggesting that we target 300 megawatts of electricity conservation and efficiency uh, over a, a, an eight year period, which would be the equivalent, of course, of the 300 megawatts we would get from a nuclear power station. But we could probably achieve uh, it at a cost of about one and a half billion dollars instead of five. So it's, it's just a much, much better way to go. And you know, uh, we need to staff SAS Power up for energy conservation. And by that I mean like, we need a hundred staff at SAS Power working on this. You know, uh, and if you go to a place like Vermont, which is smaller population than ours, uh, they've got uh, more than 120 people working on energy efficiency and energy conservation. Uh, and. Uh, and, and it really makes a difference because they go out to every major facility in the state of Vermont and they know uh, exactly the electricity needs of that facility, the equipment that is in that facility that is consuming electricity. They know where to get the most energy efficient motor or the most energy efficient refrigeration system when it's time to replace those systems. And they're prepared to put incentives in place for the businesses and the industries to do that, and for homeowners, of course, to do it as well. And it really makes a difference. They can turn things down around in a, you know, in a 48, 72 hour period. And I had the privilege of actually spending a day with them watching them do it. <laughs> it's, uh, it's quite impressive. Um, so another thing that would be great is to have time of day metering in, this, in, in Saskatchewan, and to try to shift some of the load, the electricity load that's optional, like running our, you know, our dishwasher, or our washing machine uh, or dryer into the into the uh, late hours of the evening, um, and and of course similar kind of load shifts in the industrial and the commercial sector, and um, and then how higher power rates, um, which um, no political party seems to want to touch, but really the industrial uh, consumers in Saskatchewan are getting uh, a pretty darn good deal and they're consuming about 60% of the electricity in the province. You know, so to be clear, about 150 companies are responsible for six tenths of the electricity consumption in Saskatchewan. And, um, and you can see here that we're paying right now 16.38 cents per kilowatt hour uh, in terms of uh, the energy part of our bill. So this is after the, the monthly service part in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the residential sector. Uh, small commercial, um, uh, is, uh, is paying a, a high rate too, uh, 16.52 cents, but um, when they get past consuming 14,500 kilowatt hours 
a month, uh, that drops to 6.77 cents a kilowatt hour. And for the industrial sector, they pay a big service charge. Like I don't want to dismiss it, it's just over $7,000 a month. But then they get to buy their electricity at 6.88 cents per kilowatt hour. We can bump those um, rates up a couple of cents. Um, industry will complain, uh, but, um, uh, but that is, would be a significant revenue source for SAS Power. Uh, who, by the way, is carrying a big debt load and is going to need a lot of money to uh, basically um, put in place alternatives to coal-fired generation and to build up our renewable energy system uh, across the province. So I just think industry has to, uh, has to pay more. Uh, I just want to compare the costs of a, a small modular nuclear reactor at $5 billion with the alternatives. Uh, Algonqu and these are, you know, hard numbers. Algonquin Power just built the Blue Hills um, uh, wind facility at 175 megawatts near Herbert for $280 million. $280 million. So in other words, if you double that to 560 for um, 350 megawatts, you start to compare it with a nuclear reactor, uh, you can build nine wind farms of 300 megawatts for the price that you could uh, build a, nuclear, a 300 megawatt nuclear power station. Uh, Eastervale uh, Solar in Alberta is planning a 300 megawatt solar power facility near Provost. Um, this hasn't been built yet, so this is just a stated cost by the utility, but it's $415 million, and it's going to include an energy storage component um, as well. So, um, you know, again, you could, you could build s easily six or seven of these for the, for the price of a, a, a nuclear power station. Um, in Ontario, a 250 megawatt energy storage project is now under construction um, at a cost of $800 million. And uh, it's estimating that it'll save over a 20 year period about 4 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions. So, um, uh, so you can see all, you know, I think we need to think about the alternative things that we can do with the money that is being proposed to be spent. And I'm arguing that. Um, energy efficiency, solar power, wind power, uh, energy storage, it's really worth investing in those things. Yeah, Peter, yeah. just point out that's 200, like 280 million or 415 million or 800 million. Up there we're talking about billion. Yeah, that's right, exactly. Yeah. yeah, so that's what I mean. It's, you know, we're looking at being able to do eight or nine of these kind of facilities that when it comes to wind power, uh, six or seven when it comes to solar, um, yeah, the, the economics are just dramatically different. And you know, we can, uh, you, can, you can reduce a lot of greenhouse gas emissions in the electrical sector with that kind of an, an alternative investment. Um, and um, uh, just before I touch on this slide, I just want to say that the other thing that I think we're going to have to grapple with if we, if we don't and, and this will be controversial, so and it requires debate. So I'm I'm putting it out so that we can you can disagree with me, <laughs> which I actually would be happy if we can find a better solution. But you know I don't think we can dismiss the need potentially to keep our natural gas fired power stations going, and if we and if we uh, and if we need to uh, to build another one, but of course with carbon capture and storage, and it's not clear whether that technology is going to be all that effective yet. The other way to go would be, you know, to build a cogeneration facility at a new industrial site that's going up, like BHP Billiton's potash mine, and uh, and to um, uh, and to basically generate the electricity, obviously burning natural gas, but then you also use it for industrial uh, uh, heating purposes, which the potash mine in this case would need anyway, if you know what I'm saying. But these are not particularly desirable alternatives because both of them clearly end up uh, continuing to expand the fossil fuel fleet in the province, which is not really what we want to be doing. Um, I just don't know myself, but other minds hopefully will figure this out about how we completely phase out the, uh, the 1300 megawatts of coal we have without having um, uh, you know, something like this brought online. The reality is we've been expanding natural gas a lot and we've barely phased out any coal. 
and that's what's so discouraging. And, uh, and of course, we're increasingly finding that natural gas is not a solution. I've just been talking about methane emissions. Uh, you know, there's, um, it, 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 natural gas is, is not a solution at all. And, uh, and the less we need to um, bring online, uh, the better. But we will struggle if we can't bring in hydro from Manitoba, so it, it, especially in the short term. Uh, as energy storage improves, I think these, the solutions are going to become easier. If, we, if compressed air storage really makes a difference, if we can bring online successfully a lot of energy storage and use it with renewables, um, that will be wonderful. Maybe that will solve our problem. But, I, but you know, if we're trying to figure out what we're going to do in the next eight years, um, that's not a very long period of time. And uh, struggling to phase out coal is, I think, getting it phased out is, in this province is really, really important to do. And we need to do it in the lowest emission way we possibly can. The final slide is just about, um, and this is not really an area that SES uh, deals with, but I'm, I'm just going to touch on it. Um, you know, the Nutrient has been making incredible profits over the last few years from the uh, from higher um, potash prices. And when I say incredible, I mean in the billions of dollars of additional excess profit. And, um, and uh, of course, the oil industry has had uh, you know, a couple of very good years now. I've just said here on the slide that um, Imperial Oil, Synovus, Suncor, Canadian Natural Resources, they had a combined annual profit of over 25 um, billion dollars uh, in 2023. So the industry, the oil industry that is of course making a, is one of the big, big contributors to the climate crisis, is also making a very helpful profit in Canada and can be taxed more heavily. And, uh, and, and so can um, so can the potash industry. And so um, we, some of that money obviously needs to go into healthcare, needs to go into education, needs to go into addressing homelessness and poverty, but some of it should also go into addressing the climate crisis. And um, uh, there's money available if government chooses to access it, I guess is what I'm saying. And, uh, and we're gonna need that money, uh, not just to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions, but also to do some necessary climate change adaptation. So I think I'll stop there and um, open it up for questions. And,